Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's webinar on applying to highly competitive universities. My name is Holly Haig and I am one of our Education USA advisors here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. A couple of housekeeping pieces before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded so feel free to make some notes as we go along but please don't feel like you need to frantically um, kind of write down everything you hear because you will be receiving a copy of the uh, webinar after this. Um, and also just to highlight that we will be opening the floor to your questions uh, at the end of this session. So I would ask that you hold any questions that you have towards the end because they may well be answered as we go along. And when we do open up for questions, if you could pop them in the Q&A box where we'll best be able to see them. Um, I'm quickly going to introduce myself and a little bit of the work that we do here at Education USA before handing over to our two guest speakers uh, this evening. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Holly Haig. I am an Education USA advisor and I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. But to give you a little bit of my personal background of US study, um, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm originally from Liverpool. Um, and I did my four year undergraduate degree in the US at a small liberal arts college in Vermont. Um, so I can definitely vouch for the wonderful experience that I had as a UK student in the US. And I'm sure that uh, both Karyan and Mary will speak to that uh, in their presentation as well. Um, in terms of our work as Education USA and how we can support you through your um, application process and admissions process to US universities, here at Education USA, we provide free, up-to-date and non-biased information about the application process. And we form part of a global network of around 600 advisors working from 400 centers worldwide. So if it is your dream to go to the US um, to study, that is what we are here to help with. Um, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand over uh, to our two guest speakers and introduce them off. So please feel free to come up and join us on screen. Um, first of all, we have uh, Mary Devilliers, who uh, serves as the Director of International Admissions for the University of Notre Dame, where she works collaboratively with her colleagues to welcome students from around the world to Notre Dame. She's worked in international admissions for over 11 years, having served also in similar roles for Loyola University Chicago and the University of California Irvine. Mary completed her bachelor's degree in journalism at the University of Missouri and her master's degree in higher education at Loyola University Chicago. We are also joined by Karianne Deatley, uh, who is the Associate Dean of Admissions and International Coordinator at Colgate University. Uh, Colgate is a liberal arts college of approximately 3,000 students with a 10% international student population. Um, while seeing, overseeing international recruitment at Colgate, Karyan also serves as the regional representative for students in Africa, Asia and Europe. Karyan is also a proud alumna of Colgate, graduating in 2012 with a major in English literature. So without further ado, I will um, hand over to both Mary and Karyan to get started. Great. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a joy to be here with you. My name is Mary de Villiers, and I'll have my colleague introduce herself as well. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Corey Ann Deatley. Mary, take us away. Sure. So you all are probably in the position of getting ready for your college search, um, which will also include your application process. And if you are looking at universities in the United States, there are a number of universities that are designated what we call highly selective universities. And this means that um, based on the number of applications they receive and the number of students that they ultimately will admit, um, their percentage of admission rate makes them more highly selective. That's essentially um, where that comes from. Um, so our session today is going to really focus in on the holistic review that is involved in um, that application review process. Uh, we'll walk you through all of that and what it means. Next slide. 
So um, we'll talk um, in detail on each element of the holistic review process, and we'll help you to understand the kind of strategies you might employ for maximizing on each section of um, the application to really highlight your profile and make you stand out in that process. Um, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. Next slide. Um, briefly, I just want to introduce Notre Dame, and I'm going to give Corianne an opportunity to introduce Colgate as well. Um, so the University of Notre Dame is a medium-sized Catholic research university. We're located about two hours east of Chicago, and we're an extremely beautiful residential campus um, that welcomes students from more than 80 different countries. Something that's very unique about Notre Dame is our um, really strong adherence to the central mission of our university. And while our students body is incredibly diverse in terms of who they are and where they come from. They all are very much on the same page about being a university that will be a force for good in the world. So coming into the university knowing that everything that they'll be learning and experiencing will be tools that they can then translate into the work that they do on behalf of the world at large and solving those really big problems that I know with the pandemic and everything you all have been pondering yourselves. Next slide. At Notre Dame, you can major in many different fields. You can major across fields. Um, there are numerous opportunities for research, um, as well as um, opportunities for you to study abroad. Um, and then this final picture here um, demonstrates the strength of the student body. When you think of Notre Dame, please think of the Notre Dame family. That family is with you well after you graduate from the university in the form of our alumni clubs. Um, as you can see on the previous slide, um, they're all around the world. and um, you will always be part of that fabric of the nerding family. With the next slide, I'll let Corianne introduce Colgate. You would think I would know by now when I'm muted and when I'm not, right? I apologize for that, everyone. Um, so, okay, so as um, as you go ahead and, and you just, just heard that wonderful introduction to Notre Dame, I'm going to give you five key pointers to think about when you're thinking about Colgate University. This first one is, is right in front of your face. Colgate represents the best of a research university and a liberal arts college in one. With 3,000 graduate students, or sorry, undergraduate students, only 12 uh, graduate students on our campus, that really does mean that our undergraduate students have access to research in their first few years and also that we are deliberately building a community uh, and, and committed to that liberal arts mission within the first year. Next slide. Number two, world-class academic quality at a remarkably personal level. You heard me mention that before, but we mean it. We're simultaneously by being this big liberal arts school and committed to the liberal arts mission. That's why uh, we are able to support 56 different majors at Colgate, why we have a nine to one student to faculty ratio, and we do have zero teaching assistance on our campus. Number three, the Colgate community. I also think I've slipped this into my first two uh, things as well too. The Colgate community is, a, is every bit as essential to the experience that students have. Uh, this is a school where you've heard, you, you hear me keep saying 3,000 students. What that means for our students is that we have over 300 professors. We have 92% of our students living on campus uh, throughout their time in all four years. And we have famously loyal alumni. And so it's, it's really not four years at our university. It's very much your first four years and, and beyond. Number four. Colgate University is, offers really the best of college life in a town that is actually known as one of the friendliest in America. If you can uh, see at the very bottom of this page, you'll see that we've got 4,400 residents. Yes, that is considered a small town in the US. And if you can see too, 57% of our faculty and staff, my, myself included, live in the town of Hamilton. So this really does enable our students to build a close-knit community these are not just people that they're going to be doing research with and, and finding as advisors, but these are really lifelong mentors as well. And last but not least, that Colgate just recently turned 200. And so we are incredibly proud of who we are. And 
but at the same time, we are looking ahead to these next uh, 100 years. And so that has included becoming carbon neutral within the past few years. Uh, our students have actually worked with our board of trustees to ratify a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan uh, at looking ahead to these upcoming years. And uh, even recently, particularly with the violence against Asian Americans that have been happening in the US, there have been a lot of discussions at Colgate as well too about how we can better support these communities. And then without further ado, we will get started on our session of what exactly is holistic review? We have mentioned that a whole bunch of times. Mary, I will let you go ahead and answer that question of what exactly is holistic review? Great, thank you so much, Corianne. Um, so on the next slide, Um, when we're talking about holistic review, it's important to keep in mind what universities are looking for when they're examining each part of your application. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of goals in their minds when they are creating a class of students that they'll be bringing into the university. And so when they're looking at your application, they really first and foremost want to know, will you be academically successful at our institutions? Um, they have very rigorous curriculum. It's a very fast paced moving environment. Um, you can imagine if you've always been number one in your class in high school, for example, um, you're suddenly going to be surrounded by students who were also number one in their class. You can imagine the incredible learning that takes place, but it's incredibly fast paced and it's incredibly rigorous because of the level of excellence in the classroom. Um, so they really want to see that you have the strong preparation that will be needed to be successful in that environment. They're also going to see, will you be happy and engaged and productive? Both Corey Ann and I referenced our universities in terms of the community community that exists there. And that community is one of very engaged students who are taking on leadership, who are starting endeavors, who are working with their fellow students on events and with clubs and with initiatives and activism. And we really want to know that you yourself will come into those kind of communities and find your place and really make your mark as a student there. Um, and finally, how is the student going to use all of the resources that we have to offer, the incredible facilities, the research monies, the grant money for you to study abroad, as well as the alumni network that we all have to offer. Um, so when we're looking at your application, we really want to see that you are showing those seeds of promise um, for being a really flourishing member of our student communities. And the next slide, I'm going to have Corey ann talk about the academic component of that review. Yes, you will often hear from admission officers in the U.S. that your academics are the most important part of your application because we are first and foremost schools. But all of this being said, it is not as simple as we're taking just an average of courses or we are just assigning students a number. What, what really happens is we write paragraphs about your academic performance. When we look at your application, we at, the first question we ask is what, avail, what is available at your school? Are you taking A-level courses? Are you in the IB program? Are you at an American school and taking AP courses? And we actually don't compare students who are at one school compared to another school. Even if you live one, two, three kilometers apart, it actually doesn't benefit us to compare your school curriculums because we want to know what you're going to do when you come to our school. And so that's why your academic performance is often a really good indicator of what you might be like as a student at our school. And that's where we, we often do have conversations about what we call rigor. So when you had the opportunity to challenge yourself to pick and choose your courses, what did you choose? And what were you like in those classrooms? We're looking for students who are incredibly extroverted and students who are more introverted, but write the papers that our teachers look forward to reading, where there is no quite check, 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 checklist uh, that we're looking for when reviewing a student's application. But we're just simply curious to know you. And so that's why um, take a look at some of the things that we have put here. Um, and when we talk about performance across your high school experience, uh, what, what should we know in terms of how you've challenged yourself in the classroom? And what are things that we should know about outside of the classroom that impacted your academic performance? And again, what does that say about you as a student when you face those challenges or if you face similar challenges as a student at our school? So uh, keep that in mind. And that's actually why in many ways our schools were really in some ways prepared to review applications in an even more holistic way in the pandemic because we know that your schools were actually very impacted in different ways 
And we can take that into account when reviewing applications because it is not as simple as we're looking for specific grades or specific courses. We, we really are writing paragraphs about you when we read your application. Next slide. So I'll speak very briefly on standardized test scores. Um, as you have seen this year, a huge number of universities in the United States decided to go test optional for students um, because of the difficulty of either securing a spot for testing or having testing cancellations, um, or just students being very cautious um, in consideration of the pandemic itself. Um, so in terms of why in the first place we require them, um, you know, largely throughout the United States, we don't have a standardized um, curriculum that all of our high schools follow. So there's an incredible diversity within just the U.S. itself, but then as our universities are also welcoming students from around the world, um, there's a huge diversity, obviously, from those schools. Um, and so scores are just a baseline measure, um, and they don't always determine if a student is admissible. And as we have seen with the test optional wave um, across our universities, we're attracting really exciting applicants that don't have tests scores that have all other measures to recommend them. And so this holistic review um, presentation is going to be very helpful to you because those are going to be the things we're really measuring you on if you do decide to go test optional. Um, a lot of universities have already announced that they will also be test optional for 2021 and 2022. And then Corian, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are also for 2023, right? Correct. Yes. That's great. Yeah, Notre Dame is just for 2021 and 2022. Um, so you'll want to check with your schools depending on where you are in high school at this moment. Um, but if there's schools that you are interested in applying to in the United States that are moving away from test optional and going back to requiring test scores, just know that every school is going to evaluate those scores in maybe their own way. And it's definitely okay um, if they do require a test score to reach out to them and ask them about um, if there are any things to consider, like a middle 50% range or a threshold. Um, some of the state schools may have, um, you know, a required score for certain um, opportunities or colleges. So just have a look and see. Um, every school will be different, so you really want to make sure you do your homework there. Um, but just know that a majority of the universities you might be considering are largely going to continue to be test optional moving forward. Next slide. So now that we've talked a bit about a student's academic record, know that as um, at both of our schools, as we're reviewing applications holistically, we want to know with that small amount of time that you have to devote to things outside of the classroom, what are you doing? And there's no right or wrong answer, just like each one of you are individuals. We want to know um, particularly what you've been involved in, um, that level of commitment. So it will actually ask for hours, weeks per year. Um, and whether or not you intend to do it at university. Uh, we often are looking for leadership and a sense of initiative. We're looking for um, indication, if you are pr particularly proud of um, any, um, and have been recognized in any particular way in terms of honors, awards, we want to know that this is the time for you to brag about yourself. And we also want you to know that some things that you're involved in may not be something that you consider important or something that you feel that is important to brag about, but we actually see it as a very important part of who you are. And, and that is not just simply research and internships, but that can be if you are assisting your family, particularly in this pandemic in, in an important way, whether it's caring for an elderly family member or a younger family member, whether it is a part-time job, those are all those, th those things actually tell us again, um, a level of responsibility and um, a, a commitment to um, supporting people that you uh, love or supporting yourself. And so those, that tells us again, quite a bit about what you might be like as a student at our school. Again, knowing that this pandemic has upended a lot of what students have been able to accomplish, we also are of course, taking into consideration, you can share this with us as well, too, of things you were hoping to be involved in and have not been able to be involved in because the pandemic has directly impacted that as well, too. Next slide. 
Yes, and I should say before I talk about the letters of recommendation, there is a section in the common application, which most of the highly selective universities are a part of, um, that is called the additional information section. And that's where a lot of students were giving us ideas about the things that they might have been selected for or leadership positions that they were due to receive, but because of the pandemic and a lot of the cancellation of activities um, that they were not able to participate in for their senior year. So um, if that's the case for you, please Please make good use of that additional information section. Letters of recommendation are also an important part of our application process. Um, so these are the people in your schools that see you on a daily basis. Um, if you are physically in school, um, they are working with you closely. They've gotten to know who you are, not only as a student, but as a person and a member of your school community. And all of these things, again, matter to us um, as institutions, but as also student communities that you'd be a part of. Um, so they're going to give us the context of your academic performance within your class or your school itself. Um, they're also going to highlight your strengths, your qualities, and the contributions that you've made. They're going to um, meet Maybe also help us understand if there were any needs or issues or challenges that you have faced um, or that you are currently facing or would be having to face um, while you're a student at our university so that we're alerted to that and that we take that into consideration as we go through the rest of your application. Um, but I know this is um, our letters of recommendation are a little different from what the universities in the UK will um, want in terms of the structure, um, whereas the, the letters of recommendation for the United States will focus a lot in on the person and the engagement of the student in their activities in their school community, whereas the ones for the UK will be a bit more academic focused in terms of talking about your accomplishments in the classroom and research. Um, so just know that if you are gearing your applications for the West, you might want to clue um, your recommenders into the idea that these are going to be used in the US context and be helpful in that regard to them. Next slide. So personal statements and essays. I'm going to be honest, and I think I can actually speak for Mary as well. This is our favorite part of the application process. So, uh, um, Mary, do you wait till the very end to review essays? Because I wait till the very end. I definitely wait till the very end. It's like the bow on the gift at the end. Yes. <laughs> so, so when we're reviewing your applications, we're learning so much about you. We're learning uh, your academic interests. We're learning about your entire um your entire experience at your secondary school. We're learning about what you've been interested in outside of the classroom. And so by the time that we get to your essay, I'm going to be honest, I'm looking for one thing, just simply to learn something new about you that I have not learned anywhere else in your application. And so whether that is a small story that you feel has really impacted who you are, whether it's a really big story, um, whether it is funny, whether it is more serious, um, that take some time to really think about what it is that is really essential for us to know, which again is actually very different than when you're applying in the UK. And so that's why um, actually your counselors here are a really great resource for you as well too, as you're thinking about ways to showcase yourself uh, in, this, in this personal statement, which it's, it's very short. We're talking 650 words and then they cut you off. And so um, we, of course, are looking for you to demonstrate your analytical and writing abilities. Um, it's a really wonderful way for you to be memorable in the process, but I, I think that sometimes that can be very, those can, they can feel very hard to reach. So, so I recommend when you start thinking about what to write about, think about all these other things that we're going to read about you and, and what, should, what do you wish that we actually knew about you reading your application. Next slide. And these can be very different depending on the institution and the things that are important to that institution. And I think what's really key for you when you are examining different universities and what they're asking in their supplemental essay questions. So this is going to be individual to each institution, not the common application prompts themselves. Um, is that they're sort of showing a little bit of who they are to you and seeing, you know, um, how you respond to that and what you pick from that and what you choose to share with them based on that. Um, so just to give you an example, um, obviously for our required question at Notre Dame, um, we really do value our founding by the Congregation of the Holy Cross. So we're a Holy Cross University among the Catholic universities. Um, and the idea that education 
um, educates not only the mind, but also the heart. So we really want students to know that that's an important part of who we are. Um, we also have been very active in terms of engaging in the dialogue that is happening in the United States right now surrounding, you know, Black Lives Matters. And um, as Corianne referenced, um, the, the recent events of late with Asian Americans. So we really want students to share um, things that they've already been doing in regards to making that impact in the social justice context. Um, we also have elements of our university here in terms of the traditions and um, the, the religious aspect of our school. Um, so we hope that the questions that we ask um, allow you to showcase that, um, but know that our questions for our universities can differ year to year. So these will give you an idea of what to expect from a school like Notre Dame, but they're by no means definitive for each year. And then Corian, if you wanna share yours on the next slide. Absolutely. So I hope everyone has their glasses on and can zoom in and see them because I know that it took me a while to format everything here. So you can see we've got three questions, but this year because of the, we, we knew how, that students would be disproportionately burdened by the pandemic. And so we're actually uh, letting students choose whether they want to submit all three or two or one or none at all of these questions. Uh, and when we say optional, we mean optional just like with uh, our test scores, when you submit them, um, it's entirely up to you. Uh, there's a difference between optional and recommended that you may see when you're applying to colleges, but optional truly means we're not expecting them. If you send them because you're really proud of them, absolutely please do. So this first question is about the diversity of Colgate's campus and how you plan to immerse yourself in a community such as this. Our second question is about your academic interests and something that you are particularly proud of that you would like to showcase to us that's either an academic or a personal experience. And, and then our third question is, uh, you can see in 75 characters or less, we, we thought these, some of these questions might be a nice way for you to share a little bit more about your interests. And, and again, uh, we have admitted students in, in each of our rounds that have submitted zero, one, two, and on all three. So, so we're trying, so we're being a lot more flexible this year in just enabling you to have um, uh, even more of an input just on your application. Great, next slide. So where do we go from here in terms of incorporating this information into your next steps? So just know that when we are evaluating you um, for admission at our universities, we are looking at you across the years of secondary. So the admission process really does start on the first day of school. Um, so we're gonna be looking at the grades, your activities, the habits and leadership that you formed um, starting from day one and moving across the four years. Um, so wherever you may be in that process, just know that um, there's still time to um, cultivate that, um, but also know that, um, you know, we will be looking at everything across the board. Um, and then start your college search as early as possible. Maybe you've already started to research some of your universities, taking advantage of how accessible we all are now that we've kind of moved to a virtual space. Um, I know most universities in the United States are um, either daily or multiple times a week having virtual information sessions, and as well as other virtual events that you can attend. Um, so we've never been more accessible than we are now. So um, please, I encourage you start now and start narrowing down your list based on what you're learning from each of the schools you explore. Um, and then I also am going to turn over to Corianne to do the next two points. So, um, so yes, uh, we, we want to make sure that you are spending time on, on these. Uh, we can actually tell when students have submitted 20 applications compared to 10 applications. Uh, students are, uh, we see less errors. We see, you'd be surprised that we, we do sometimes see silly errors in the process that, we're, that make us think that um, students are, are unfortunately not spending as much time on it as, as they should, or, or, um, or they, they let something slip that is not um, evident of, or not important uh, Nope, that's not what I'm trying to say. That um, is something that is so different about the school that, that they're clearly confusing us with another school. So what we mean it that encourage plenty of time for each part of this application, supplemental essays, recommenders, and creating the essay itself. And if you do have questions, reach out to us directly. 
we are here to be really a gateway for you and the rest of our campus community. So whether you have particular questions for current students, whether you have questions about a particular department, uh, we are here to connect you with professors and students and also to answer your basic questions about uh, life at our university. And so that way you can get a really good sense of what it is like to be a student at our school, even if you're not able to visit. As Mary said, we by, by becoming more and more virtual, we're, we're more accessible than we have been before. And, and we mean it, we are quite literally just an email away and no question is a silly question. So please, please, please reach out to us. We're here to support you throughout this process. And uh, the last uh, slide, which you saw before, is actually our email addresses. And, and we'll, we'll enable this, at, we'll, actually, we'll just take this opportunity to now open everything up to questions that you have, um, because this, the point of why we're doing this is, is for you, knowing where you are in the process, Knowing there is so much uncertainty, we, we want to make sure that we can be here to answer questions that you have. Great. Thank you both so much for that wonderful overview about holistic admissions. And I think you both gave, you know, such a, so many nuggets of really good information that I know that a lot of British students have questions about. So I, I really appreciate both of you giving such a great intro to this and as Karianne said we're going to now open the floor to your questions so if you do have a question that you'd like to ask directly to Mary or Karianne or I can even step in to give a more general perspective please do pop those in the Q&A box and we will get to your questions as we go. Great I can already see a couple coming in. Okay, I actually have a question that is specific about Notre Dame, Mary. Um, how would um, religion, your personal religion, work in the admissions process if you perhaps aren't Catholic or are, belong to a different religious faith? Sure, thank you. That's a great question. And it's one that we get frequently. And the thing to keep in mind about the word Catholic is the capital C is the religion, um, but we also really embrace the lowercase c, which means universal. Our student body is made up of students of all faith backgrounds and also students of no faith background. Um, and the global diversity of our university really speaks to that. Um, we have many opportunities for students across faiths to engage in whatever faith life traditions um, they honor, as well as choosing to not engage, including our Catholic students. So um, if you are somebody that is actively seeking um, for that personal enrichment through spiritual life. Um, there are numerous opportunities for you to engage in different ways, um, but it's not anything that is required. We do have a requirement for all students that we feel are really good um, hallmarks of a liberal arts-based education in a global society. So we do require students to take two classes in philosophy and two classes in theology, with theology being the study of religion itself. So students can really customize that based on their own belief structure and um, what they choose they really want to explore. Um, and a lot of students really value those classes and many of them will end up taking up like a minor or even a second major in those areas having never been exposed to them before. That's great. And I think that really speaks to the value of a liberal arts curriculum, right? And that's a similar, I know that religious element perhaps isn't as strong of a focus at Colgate, but that idea of kind of picking something up and looking at something from a different perspective is very much uh, kind of consistent amongst liberal arts style of education across US universities. Yes, yes and yes. <laughs> Great, um, so we now have a couple of questions about financial aid and funding. And I wonder if both of you, and we have to start with Carrie ann talk a little bit about what are the best ways in, in making yourself a competitive applicant when it comes to securing financial aid as an international student? And maybe if both of you could provide some insight into what that process looks like at your colleges. Mm -hmm. Good question, and, and I actually think Mary and I may have some similar answers here. Holgate meets uh, what's called 100% of demonstrated financial need. So what that means is that Holgate actually does not have academic scholarships. When students are applying, they are going to be, and particularly international students, they are asked to fill out a form called the CSS profile. 
In this form, there are a lot of personal questions about income and assets and siblings that may be also at university. And from there, our financial aid office takes into account how much your family qualifies for for financial aid. And so our school doesn't do what is called gapping because there are some universities where you may demonstrate that you qualify for a $60,000 financial aid package, but the school will only give you a $20,000 financial aid package. And that's where you hear about those student loans being, through, uh, being really problematic for students because they have to take out those loans elsewhere and not through the school. So because we're meeting 100% of demonstrated need, that's just simply another part of your application. There is not, um, besides filling out that form, there are not additional questions. There are not additional things that you need to do just by simply submitting everything on time and checking your email in case there are questions from our financial aid office uh, to make sure that you have everything complete because our deadlines are the exact same date. Yes, and at Notre Dame, um, our application process is has similar qualities to Colgate, but it's a little bit different. So um, when we're reading your application, um, as a student who will need a visa to study in the United States, we require you to submit the certification of finance form. Um, and that's something that all universities will ask for, but they may ask for it at a different time in the process. We ask for it as part of your application so that you can demonstrate to us. Um, there's two options. Either one, I will not require financial assistance at any point during my studies, or two, I will require financial assistance. And then you'll let us know, um, you know, either option, what your funding is. So for, you know, for if you are saying I have no financial need, then you just put in for the one year. If you are seeking aid, we want to know for the four years or five, if you're doing our architecture program, what your family believes they can contribute, and then also do the CSS profile. Our financial aid office will assess your needs. Sometimes they'll come back and say, no, we should be providing more to the student based on what they've given us. So um, just like Colgate, Notre Dame will meet 100% of that demonstrated need. Um, it is slightly a competitive process at Notre Dame for international financial aid, um, only in in that it's a little bit more limited than what we were able to offer domestically. But every year we welcome a number of candidates um, coming into our institution. And I would say to be competitive for financial aid, you just need to be competitive for admission. Um, so that's really what we're looking at first and foremost. And then we're looking to see if we can fund. And I echo that as well too, what Mary just said. I don't need to repeat it. You said it well. <laughs> Great. We've also got a question about letters of recommendation. And I really liked in your presentation um, the, that you highlighted the difference between kind of US and UK letters of recommendation, um, because I think we as Brits can be very guilty of exercising British reserve, which is definitely not a place to be doing so in your um, applications to US universities and you want to be encouraging your referees to write in a, in a you know an enthusiastic tone uh, but this question to do with letters of recommendation um, has to do with uh, sort of how recent be, they should be or how well you need to know whoever it is who's doing that reference. Um, for example, if you've moved high school partway through your program and you've just, perhaps you've gone to a new sixth form, um, could you ask someone from your GCSE school to do a reference? Um, to give a bit of a general answer to that question, it's going to look a little bit different at each university and some universities might specify who they would like to do those um, college recommendation letters. From our standpoint, if it's not made clear on a university website, always try to go for a recent recommendation uh, because universities really want to get a sense of what you're up to at the moment, not what you achieved when you were nine years old, for example. Um, but I'll let Mary and Karyan kind of provide a bit of an insight into what their instructions are. Sure. So we would say at Notre Dame um, for year 11 and 12, so that'd be 12 and 13. So I would say if you've changed schools for sixth form, um, you want to definitely use um, a teacher from a subject. We, pr we prefer and we, we sort of mandate that it be a core subject teacher. So when we say core subject, we mean math, science, English, social science, and or foreign language. Um, and if you did have a teacher from IGCSC that you wanted to include a reference for, that would fall under sort of like our optional letter. So only one letter is required, but you may have additional teachers or a coach or a mentor that you wanna include a letter from. Those are falling into the optional bucket. So just make sure you have that one 
like sixth form teacher um, that's speaking on your behalf and then the others can come. Holly summarized this right. It depends. And, and with Colgate, uh, we will allow the most recent three years. Uh, and the reason why it, I don't know if we've explicitly said this, but the reason why is because the, many of these classes are going to be what prepares you for your first year at our university. And so that's why there is more of an emphasis on the later years compared to your earlier years. So we, we will accept recommendations from uh, GCSE uh, teachers, uh, any, any of the past three years, core curriculum classes as well. And if you have any particular questions too, you can reach out to us directly always as well. Great. Um, we have had quite a few questions about standardized testing, whether that's SAT or ACT. If anyone wants to find out more information about how to prepare for those exams, maybe, you know, which one to take. Um, I'm sure both Mary and Karianne would back me up in saying that U.S. universities view ACTs and SAT reasoning tests the same. It's kind of a bit like Coke and Pepsi. It's, you know, sim similar kind of ilk. You may have a preference um, as a, someone who's taking the test. So what we would recommend you do is on our website, we have a lot of free resources where you can actually sit and take a timed practice test at home see whichever one feels best, whichever one you perhaps score more highly on and go for that one if, you know, tests are required or if you would like to take them. Um, I've also had a question about kind of, should I still be taking these tests if they are optional? And, um, you know, you both covered this a little bit in the presentation, but it would be great to kind of re-emphasize that fact of, should I still be taking these tests if they're not required? Does optional really mean optional when it comes to standardized testing? Yes, optional really means optional. There is a difference between optional and recommended. And I'll say it again, that when we open up applications, we are not expecting to see them. If you have submitted them because you're proud of them, then that is something we will look at. But it is not required. We do not second guess when we open up an application. Where is it? I can't see it on this page. Um, not at all. And, and in fact, uh, this was our first year going test optional. We didn't miss it this year when we were reviewing applications. So uh, know that it is absolutely not required. If you are looking at any school that has required it, then consider taking them. But if you already know from your list of schools that, that it's not going to be required, then uh, again, work with your counselor just to make sure, but you may not have to take them. Yeah, and a lot of universities this year will be releasing statistics about the percentage of their applicant pool that either did a test or didn't do a test, and then perhaps also the percentage that were admitted that were also choosing the test optional route. So we hope that that information will assure you that whatever path is the right one that you feel is the right one for you, that's the path you should be on, and you're not in an advantage for having a test score, and you're not in a disadvantage for not having a test score. Great. Thank you both for that. I think it really is reassuring to hear it from the people who are making those decisions that, um, you know, your application won't be negatively impacted if you're not submitting a test score at a test optional school. Um, another question we have come in through here, which I think we kind of touched on throughout the presentation, but in a process of holistic review, would you say that academics are as or more important than extracurricular involvement and how what's the relationship between those two in in a sort of well-rounded application i would say there's uh, yeah i would say at least i mean i think for both of us they're the foremost thing that we have to consider that's like the first thing that we have to consider um, we also want to know in addition to being well prepared for success at our institution, that you are also someone that will be very highly engaged at our universities. Um, so these are, you know, that will vary by university and the culture that they have on their campus. Um, but I can say that both matter, but first and foremost, you have to be successful as a, as a potential student at a university. Yes, and yes, and yes. We, we are looking for students who are going to challenge our professors, who are going to follow them around in their office hours, have dinner with them and also be engaged in our community in other ways outside of the classroom. So they they go hand in hand, but we we very much do not want to admit any student who we think is going to struggle at our school. So that's why we do talk about academics first and foremost. 
We've had a couple of questions that have to do with students' particular context, and I'm going to group them together, but perhaps Mary, if you want to take the first question and then Corianne take the second. Um, so the first one is, when it comes to extracurricular activities, what happens if there's not a lot available in the area that I'm from? For example, if I'm from a remote area of Scotland, um, how will that be taken into consideration in the application process? And then Corianne, uh, we have a question about when it comes to my context, is there any advice that you'd give with regards to building an application? So would you say that taking three A-levels and a selection of really strong extracurricular activities would be better than taking four A-levels and not as many extracurricular activities? So for the first one, you know, obviously, even within the United States, it's going to vary greatly depending on where your high school is located, what size your high school is, and, you know, what is available financially for that high school. Um, so we are, again, really contextual when we're looking at your extracurricular activities. Um, we're not expecting to see a whole litany of things if that is not being offered at your school. We do know that there may be other things that are taking up your time. And um, as you recall on the slide, about the extracurricular activities. Um, if you um, are part of a farming family, write about the activities that you're doing to help the family farm. Talk about the family responsibilities you might have. Maybe you have a part-time job or you're helping a family down the road that has a lot of children and you're helping with the, the home responsibilities there. There are a number of ways that students engage outside of the classroom that are not specifically extracurricular activities. Um, and it's important that you share with us what that is for you. Um, and that's, you know, that's wonderful to see. Um, be, I mean, we love that diversity among our student body as well. And in terms of, is it better to take three A-levels and focus a ton on my extracurriculars or take four A-levels? I don't have the answer for you. You're not gonna like that, but there's no, you heard me say before that there isn't a set checklist of what you need to do to get into our universities. And we also want you to be the best person that you can be in this pandemic as you're looking ahead academically, as you're able to get involved in things outside of the classroom. And so it may make sense for you to take three A-levels and, and really focus on some of the things that you're involved in outside of the classroom. It may also be that you're really excited to take four A-levels. To be honest, we admit both types of students. And so there is no right or wrong answer here. The, what I will share is to continue working with your counselors with what makes sense for you. You should not be, um, we do not want you to feel that you were overburdened in, in your final year taking A-levels because you were trying to impress universities. That is not the reason why you should be taking each one of your A-levels. You should be doing it because you're interested in these subjects and you want to explore them at that level. Thank you. Um, we have another question about um, gap years, especially at the moment during COVID. Um, and I wondered, you know, how, how is, what's the impact been in terms of admissions at your universities, have you found that more students are taking gap years? Um, is it an option uh, to defer your application in the context of COVID? What does that situation look like? Sure, so at Notre Dame, we were only impacted by largely the students that couldn't get visas to come to campus. We've physically been um, in campus from the fall semester onward. So um, we did have a number of students in different countries that opted um, to um, do, we had a couple of options. So one was to study away locally. Notre Dame has campuses um, in London and Rome, as well as a global gateway in Beijing. And so those became hubs for students to study abroad locally. Um, so instead of making the journey all the way over to the US, they were closer to home in case they needed to be home because of the pandemic. We also had some students who were taking advantage of online classes that we offer through an auxiliary program on campus. So they weren't necessarily, um, you know, doing online classes per se, but they were getting credits that they can use for that first semester so that they'll easily catch up and be fully on track for a four year finish. Um, and then we did have a large number of all of those students that were overseas join us for spring semester. There are some countries where the visa 
um, opportunities were really just not there for them to be able to come and join us this spring. So they will be coming in, but it is not impacting our admission numbers at all because it's such a small number. Um, so those students are just being brought into the fold when they get to campus physically. Similarly at Colgate, we had, I believe it was 28 students from last year's class who opted to defer to, to next year. So this is really an, an, an essentially did not impact our admission process for this upcoming year. And for our first year students who were not able to get visas, when Colgate reopened, we gave every student and professor the opportunity to come to campus and take classes in person, to teach classes in person, or to be remote. And, and for students, they could choose to be remote. And for that select group of first year students whose visa appointments were later in October and, and even uh, the beginning of November, we let students do what we call the hybrid method where they were taking classes remotely until they could get their visas and come to campus and quarantine and then become uh, physically a part of the Colgate community. So uh, um, I anticipate that we will have a similar process next year. So in terms of your application, if you're thinking of taking a gap year, reach out to us directly. It's not something you always need to share with us in the application process, but if you do have any questions, feel free to let us know. Great. Um, really nice question here that I guess is geared more towards kind of international students once they arrive on campus. What kind of support networks exist at US colleges for international students, especially, you know, being new to an area, new culture, new country, new continent? Um, what, what does that kind of look like and what can international students expect to see as they arrive on campus? Mm -hmm. Corian, you want to take that one first? A lot of support. You're going to, <laughs> as soon as you deposit, you are going to start hearing from our office of, um, our, we call it our Office of International Student Services, but you will start getting questions about, or hearing about how to fill out visa forms, questions about appointments that you may have, and pretty much getting you ready to actually travel to campus with quarantine restrictions. Uh, what should you know as you are leaving, um, as, as you are leaving and as you are arriving, what things you should pack, what things can you buy once you arrive? Uh, we, we each have um, orientations where we can support our students and, and talk a little bit about, um, at, particularly at, at Colgate, there is an international student orientation where we talk about things like culture shock. What are some weird things that Americans do that you're going to have to get used to? What um, are some of the ways that you are used to doing research or writing academically that are going to be different and your professors are going to expect you to know, but also to enable you to uh, um, find your voice as well too, because so many of our professors, uh, once they know where you are from and who you are, they're going to be flexible as well too, but also so enabling you to um, create that advocacy for yourself is also an important part of orientation. It's also often where a lot of our students make their friends throughout all four years too. So it's very much community building, academics, uh, resources, and um, everything in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similarly at Notre Dame, um, and then also to um, allowing you to arrive a few days ahead of the US-based um, first year students so that you can find your feet, you can get settled in, you can find your way around campus. If your parents are accompanying you, um, they'll have opportunities for programming as well. Um, and then um, during the year, and I'm sure same at Colgate, um, numerous student organizations based on culture, based on um, parts of the world that you're from, as well as just general international events through our International Student Services Office. I'm sure the same is at Colgate as well. Um, so really making sure that you feel that that sense of community among students that know what you're going through as someone not um, really from within the United States, but then also um, still mixing and mingling very much so with your domestic counterparts um, and just, you know, really experiencing really great communities all around. Great. Um, we've had a couple of questions that I'll try to sort of merge into one because I do think they're in a similar vein. So the first one is how do you kind of U.S. qualifications like bachelor's degrees compare internationally, for example, when a student is coming back to the UK and seeking work, and similarly about the value of the liberal arts style of education, which is one that is quite literally quite foreign to a lot of 
UK students were used to very much picking one subject and running with it at university. And I wonder if you both can speak to a the sort of value of the qualifications that come out of these top US universities and also the value of a liberal arts curriculum. I'm happy to take the first part if you want to take the second part, Corian. Sure. Okay, so in terms of the value that you're building in um, as a student within the United States, there's a lot of hands-on experiential learning that is part of the university experience um, within the United States. So you are really building yourself up and that's in a number of contexts. So it can be through internships that you do either during the school year or during your, your school breaks. It can be through research that you're conducting both alongside faculty as well as um, your own independent research but through grants that you can secure at our institutions. Um, it can also be the mentorship that you're receiving from professors and the networks that you're tapping into um, and that can be global. Um, so international students are really fortunate that they are going to be building a network not only within the United States but also being able to um, tap into more global networks. Um, so a lot of the companies that a lot of students at our institutions might might be working with or organizations um, will have opportunities for you to engage professionally outside of the United States as well. Um, so it really can take you anywhere, um, but just know that um, it's not only just learning, you know, within the classroom context, it's also learning in a really practical way that you can demonstrate through your CV once you leave the institution. And in terms of return on investment, I, I guess I could go on for a while about this, but what I will say is one, uh, both of our institutions are looking ahead to your future. Uh, I do not have the same phone that I had four years ago. And so uh, when we think about jobs and what types of jobs will be available to students four years from now, uh, we, we are expecting the world to be different. And so, uh, our philosophies are not preparing you for just your first job. It is preparing you to have the tools to change careers and to uh, switch to your second, third, and fourth job. I, I have read several scary numbers of how many jobs students are expected to have once they graduate um, until they retire. I think I've been seeing the number that I've been seeing consistently is nine. And so uh, this is not just us preparing you for your first job. Our, our belief is that you need to be able to evolve your skills in whatever career set you go into. So whether you become a, uh, you go into the realm of neuroscience research or whether you go into engineering or whether you go into journalism, you're going to need to constantly be reevaluating information that is coming up, new research, and to either incorporate that into what you're doing or not. And particularly in this more and more global world where you can communicate across the world so much quicker, this is such an important skill. And so we know these are really intangible things, but the reality is that graduate schools know our institutions and world-renowned businesses know our institutions. And so when you are applying, the fact that you have a degree from us does set you apart when you are applying as well too. And we have access for you to do all the significant amount of research and these extracurricular involvements at a different stage than you are able to do right now. And that will absolutely impact what your CV looks like when you're applying. Yeah, I, I would also tack on that you can study more than one subject and you aren't bound to what you come in as. So if you do decide, hey, economics seemed like it was what I wanted to do, but now I'm really more focused in on moving like really into accountancy or moving into engineering, you have that flexibility at the universities in the United States. And so you can make your path forward, your own individual path based on majors and minors that you might weave together. Absolutely. I think I can really vouch from my personal experience of studying in the US that exactly both what you were saying. Um, I went into college thinking I was going to be an international politics and economics major and ended up majoring in Spanish. So this idea of flexibility and being able to, it's kind of like a buffet, right? You can try out different things and figure out what you like the taste of. Um, and I just think that the US can offer so many different experiences uh, that perhaps aren't as readily available um, at UK universities. So thank you both for sharing on that. 
Um, another couple of questions about the personal essay. Do you have any tips on how to write in, in these essays and when to sort of begin pooling ideas that may be good to, to include in the personal essays? Well, the big tip that I had, I know I said earlier, is to, to think about tangibly what is something that we're, we might not be reading anywhere else. I do recommend you start it during the summer because even though it is 650 words, if you apply with the coalition application, I think it's 550, it's going to be short. And so you're going to want to make sure that that is done given everything else that you're going to be juggling in your final year. Yeah, and I would say you want it to be well organized. Um, obviously with it being short, you may have a lot to tell us and not that much space to make it work. And so um, you wanna make sure that you're organizing it in a way that gives us the impact um, before we get to the conclusion, as well as making sure um, it's really about you and not about someone else that you've experienced. Um, and also just to make sure that it really speaks to the experience you had, the growth you took away from it, you know, the forward looking vision that you have because you've had that experience. And just know too, I know sometimes students think they have to have these really big profound things um, to write about, but uh, some of the best essays I've read have just really been about like simple things. I mean, one girl wrote about grocery shopping in the three different countries that she lived and just the, the, compar the, the comparative imagery that came out of that. Um, but it could be, you know, even as simple as something that you do every day and how that really is part of who you are. And that, that's a great essay to read. Yeah, I always love hearing examples of, of essays. I just think it's so interesting to see the different ways students can go down and, and it's a really an opportunity to, to be yourself and to express those ideas. So definitely take that, that time, I think, as Karyan said, to begin those as early as you can, to sort of jotting down ideas as you go through year 12, perhaps, of things you might want to talk about until those uh, questions come out in the summertime. Really nice question here. What are the biggest mistakes made by students when they apply to your universities? Not checking their email when we have <laughs> follow-up questions or if uh, there was a processing error and for some reason it looks like we're missing a teacher recommendation. Uh, not, not checking email. That's going to be the way that we're communicating with you. I'm not going to message you. I'm not going to uh, find you on any social media, I'm going to email you and you'd be surprised how many students don't check their email. That's a really good one. I wish I thought of that one. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, check the content of all your essays before you send them. Um, it's great if you want to write about how much you love the University of Connecticut, but if you're applying to Colgate or you're applying to Notre Dame, we are not the University of Connecticut. Um, if you reference a certain color scheme on campus that is not our color scheme, um, you know, you really want to just double check and triple check because we know sometimes you guys are repurposing essays. That's great, but you can't just wholesale repurpose it. You need to make sure it's addressing what is being asked and that it does not contain things that are not at either of our institutions. Good tips. <laughs> um, a couple of questions here about extenuating circumstances. Someone has asked what differentiating factors do you tend to look for in students outside of academics and extracurricular involvement? And I know that there is likely a very long list <laughs> of different scenarios, but I wondered if either of you could speak to some examples. Uh, can you elaborate a little more on just how you think? Yeah. How, yeah. I mean, what, in addition to once you've looked through extracurricular lists and you've looked at a student's essay and um, academic uh, achievements and potential, for example, if a student is going to elaborate something in the extenuating circumstances area of the common app, mm -hmm. what, what are the sort of common things that students might write about or that you might be looking for in that are you taking into account you know context from a school situation or family context um what are the other common areas that might come up there that students you know are welcome to share because I think 
in UK applications, it's not so common perhaps to have that space where you can really share what is going on. And so what is too much to be adding? What is not enough? Um, I think that's kind of what the question is getting at. Okay, I appreciate that. I would say uh, we see, I think you can, ex you can say anything and everything in that additional information. Uh, we sometimes see students who uh, in their activities list feel like that that little bit of description is not enough and so they elaborate a little more on that. Uh, every, um, every school, when they're submitting your transcripts and your recommendations, they do send what we call a school report and so that is where we will see how your school was impacted by the pandemic in terms of just closing or pass-fail courses. Um, predicted A levels. We'll we'll see that information there. But if you feel that you were um, that you want to make sure that you're covering your bases and want to talk about a particular class and how you were impacted, you're welcome to do that as well. You do not need to send a second essay to us. We often have students who uh, say, "I love this essay that I wrote, and I love this one, and I'm not sure which one to send." And so then they'll send both. They'll put one in the essay portion, and then they'll put a second essay in the additional information section. And that is not <laughs> needed. We are asking specifically <laughs> for one. It is also okay if you feel that your application is complete without this section. You do not need to put in any information. We admit a lot of students this year. Uh, this year, we admitted a lot of students who did not add any information here. It is truly meant if, if you want to add any information, but it is not required. Yeah, and I will say that your educational journey is a human journey as mm -hmm. well. And to every human's life may come, you know, disruptions based on family, based on health, based on economic circumstances, um, based on political circumstances, depending on where you're coming from. And so we, if, if that had an impact on your educational journey, it is a good place to let us know about that so we have that context. We don't want to see a complete shift within your academic record and not have an understanding as to why did that happen or what were the circumstances surrounding that. So as best as you can share and potentially have your recommender share, um, we think that that's important. Um, if it's just something very personal that you want to share, that's fine too. Um, but we, it's very helpful for us to have that context um, because we do value knowing that um, and we honor that, um, you know, that that's part of your journey. Absolutely. Um, we have got quite a few additional questions about standardized testing and academics, which I'm going to try to group together a little bit. So we've had um, one question saying, you know, in the absence of an ACT or an SAT, then how do colleges use GCSEs and predictions to assess academic potential? Mary, do you want to take this one? Do you want me to take this one? I, I will let you start and then I can fill in where we need. <laughs> so we absolutely look at them. We absolutely want to see when we talk about how have you performed academically, we take a look at your GCSE scores. And then we are curious, what courses did you choose in your A-level curriculum and how are you performing in them? We are also going to look at your predicted grades. Uh, at Colgate, we did make it optional for this year. I do not know whether it will be optional for next year, uh, but know that we are also keeping a close eye on how the pandemic impacted uh, A-level grades this past year. And, and so just know too that this is, um, be, because this is not just simply a calculation of, uh, and we, we've said before, these are paragraphs that we're writing about your academics. And so, uh, we are looking at everything because all of that tells us what you might be like as a student in the classroom, but we are also closely following how students may be impacted this year uh, with A-levels as well. Mm -hmm. what I forget? Did I miss anything, Mary? No, I, I, I also um, just know too that we're aware of the different ways that you're achieving um, education um, like it could be A levels, it could be B tech, it could be pre U, yes, yes, yes. Um, and we're keeping that in mind. Um, and excellence matters a lot, um, especially the more highly selective an institution becomes. So um, yes, that all of these things are going to really matter to us when we're looking at your application. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a similar question, which I think was kind of answered just then about you know 
SATs can have an important influence at times when submitting those test scores if you choose to. But the question was how important are A-levels by comparison? I definitely say that, you know, your GCSE and A-level achievements are going to be valued more highly than an ACT or an SAT score because obviously university admissions officers recognize that they're the qualifications that you're spending 100% of your time inside the classroom working on. Um, so I hope that answers your question as well. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, kind of health insurance and whether that is included in financial aid packages at your universities and what that looks like. Um, and I will just say that this is going to vary from institution to institution. So it's really important that as you're looking into universities of interest, you get that sense of what will health insurance look like. But I wondered if both of you could speak to what that looks like for international students at your institutions. Yeah. So at Notre Dame, we do include it as part of our financial aid package. Um, we require international students to have a U.S.-based policy it, unless their parents have a, you know, multinational policy that they're under. Um, but I think that's in pretty rare. Um, just depends. Um, but yeah, you will be required to have it and it will be covered by your financial aid package. If you are coming in without financial assistance, then you'll be responsible um, for shouldering that cost. And it will include a health center on campus that can manage pretty much most of the ailments that you may have, but if you do have something that needs extended care, they're going to triage you and have you go locally to a place that will accept your, your health insurance. And at Colgate, it's not covered by our financial aid package. And so if you do have any questions about it, uh, what will happen is our Office of International Student Services will work with you before you're even planning your flights to campus with figuring out which is the best plan for you. Uh, it's all available on our website so that you can have a sense of how much uh, it's going to fiscally impact you and your family, but also what the appropriate plan is. And also you and you have our resources because healthcare in the United States, it can be very confusing and you will likely have questions. And so students on our campus do have resources as well, too. But yes, it is required every year, and uh, but it is not a part of our financial aid process. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions as well about different types of qualifications or additional projects that students might be doing inside of the classroom. So, um, for example, are EPQs valued and recognised by US universities? Also had questions about um, BTEC courses, so more vocational courses and how they're interpreted in the application process. Um, as a general note, just to jump in, this is going to look differently at different universities. So I'm sure carrie and Mary can give a bit of a sense of what it looks like um, at their schools. Yes, so I can even start by saying that uh, it is not our admission office that determines whether or not a student receives academic credit when they come to our school. It's actually our faculty and our registrar. So some departments are, um, are have a really distinct philosophy on what they want their students to accomplish in their first two years. And so even if a student does incredibly well on a particular exam, uh, I'm, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm thinking in particular some of our English, uh, our English department, some of our language departments, you will, you will come in um, and, and still need to take those one-on-one, -on -one, 101 courses. Uh, there are other um, there are other school, um, other departments where you may be able to achieve credit and jump into a sophomore level class. Um, in some cases, maybe even a junior level class because of your performance. The BTEC courses, uh, so at, at Colgate, we are a liberal arts university. And so it is very unlikely that those credits will transfer. But when we are reviewing applications, I will say that um, your EPQs, we understand how much work they go in, uh, how much work that it is required, even if the, you might not get deliberate academic credit, but we, we absolutely value that. Uh, we understand BTEC courses and how challenging they can be. So as regional admission officers, we're absolutely keeping mind on that. But in terms of academic credit, it's going to absolutely depend on each school and in some cases, depending on each department. Yeah, and at Notre Dame, um, we actually don't award credit for A-levels or BTEC. Um, 
So coming in, um, you do have the opportunity to placement test um, for math as well as foreign language. Um, and um, you can get special department permissions, but if you have requirements you have to fulfill as part of the university requirements, you're still gonna have to take those. Um, and just be assured that a lot of the students that are coming in with AP credit, um, they are still having to do university requirements, but they might just be able to move to a higher level um, for the credit that they're getting for those AP credits. So really you all are getting amazing preparation to come in and maybe have sort of an edge um, with your studies at the university. And I think that in itself is well worth engaging with that rigor. Great. We have an interesting question switching gears a little bit um, about extracurricular lists and, and how they are viewed. And so the question is, do you think um, sort of perseverance and long-term involvement is more impactful or more valued than a leadership role? For example, if um, a student has been competitively swimming for 10 years in a swim club, or they have just this year founded a basketball club in their school, how, how would an admissions officer kind of weigh those two up or compare those two to each other? We may admit both. We're not simply <laughs> comparing you by your academic, we're, we're, it's not as if we create charts and say, here's this student, here's this student, here's this student. We review every application um, as its own individual application. Uh, so you are not separated from your scores, from your extracurriculars. We review you as a person. Yeah, and it's quality over quantity. So we, oftentimes we may see in some apps where it's like one year, one time, and it's a whole list of that. You know, wh where is, were you able to make an impact through that engagement with that particular activity? Um, I would say if you're more committed and, and or a leader, you have more impact. So yeah, I mean, all things matter to us. Um, but yeah, I would say quality over quantity. Absolutely. Um, another question we have here has to do with early applications and applying at different um, decision points throughout the year. Um, Mary, I wondered if you could give a bit of an overview about what deadlines tend to exist at US universities, because not everyone will be familiar with those. And then Karianne, if you could speak a little bit uh, to maybe some of the advantages or disadvantages of applying at different points throughout the year, and um, whether it's more, you know, is it easier to get admitted early decision, that type of piece, um, that seems to be kind of the question. Sure, so this is gonna vary across universities. I know we have so many loopholes that students can go through, but it's important to understand that. So for in terms of the earlier deadlines, um, some of our state schools have their own earlier deadline that kind of subverts the usual timeline that a lot of universities use. I'm, I'm thinking about like University of California and Georgia Tech. Um, they have earlier deadlines that are just their one deadline. So that's important to pay attention to. Then you have um, two different kinds of early deadlines. There's early action and early decision. So early action is a non-binding early deadline. It just simply means that you are submitting your application early to that institution. The only exception for early action would be if a school is restrictive early action, um, and there are a few of them. Um, Notre Dame is one of them. And that means that you cannot be applying early decision binding and apply early action to that school at the same time. So you have to make your choice. Early decision is a binding process. You have to sign off that you understand that if you are admitted, you will attend. Your parent signs off, your counselor signs off. So it, 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 it's a big deal. Um, there, is, um, there are different levels of creativity in terms of the early decision deadlines. There can be early decision, early decision two. Um, some schools have some other categories for early decision. Um, so you just want to make sure you're navigating that appropriately based on the, re the requirements for that in particular institution. Then there's regular decision. And a lot of students are going to apply regular decision to a lot of universities, especially if they get deferred from the early action or the early decision schools, or if they don't, if they're rejected um, in those early deadlines. So 
you're going to probably have a mix of applications based on where it is you feel your heart is called to attend and the other schools that you feel pretty confident that you would have a, a really enriched experience um, and that you could also see yourself at. So, um, Corian, I don't know if you want to add to that. <laughs> and this is all why, it, however you keep yourself organized, you need to do so. It is not easy to keep track of all of these deadlines, how this might impact your application, what additional requirements, supplemental essays, not supplemental essays, uh, are. Um, uh, do you need your counselor to submit, submit something additional? Uh, so make a point to uh, whether it is a binder, whether it's a document, however you stay organized, um, do so because it will be very hard to keep all of this in your head. In terms of advantages, there can absolutely be advantages to applying to a school early decision or at the beginning of the rolling process. And that's because each of our schools are under a pretty big expectation that we are going to hit a certain class size. And, and that's where it gets exciting that we, we, we know that every year we have an expectation to build a particular class size. We cannot over-enroll too much because then we won't have enough beds for students. And we do not want to under-enroll because then we won't have enough students to support the programs that we want to. So because every year we're looking for a specific size of students, students who are applying early decision are going to an early action to maybe the first round of students that we see in that applicant pool that year. And so early decision, because it's binding, schools may say you're choosing us out of the 4,000 colleges in the U.S. that you could be applying to, let alone in the world. And so that's a big commitment. And so uh, there may be a benefit to admitting those students in early decision. And in terms of rolling admission, uh, students may will receive acceptances very early on, and then they will choose to deposit. And so then students who apply at the very end of the rolling decision deadline are still within the deadline, but there may be actually less spots available. And so uh, keep that in mind too, that you may choose to apply early action to one school, one school rolling, and then one school early decision, and then three schools regular decision. This is why um, you, you should be working with your counselor because there, um, there certainly are going to be different advantages depending on the schools that you're applying to. Yes, definitely. Um, we had a question actually that just came through about what is a counsellor, I guess that's a bit of a terminology difference, but um, a counsellor will be, um, you know, usually kind of a head of sixth form or a head of year or someone like that who has a view of you as a whole within your sixth form or your school and they'll be usually doing one of your uh, letters of recommendation or involved in kind of the school profile elements of your application submitting those school documents so that's who a counsellor is um, I hope that makes th things a little bit clearer. Um, and we are uh, Holly I didn't mean to interrupt but we are very flexible uh, with our international mm -hmm. students in what defines a counsellor whether it is a particular school official sometimes it has been English teachers again reach out if you have particular questions Yes. And I can't express this enough. If anything is unclear or perhaps you have a particular set of circumstances that you're not sure about, do reach out to your admissions counsellor at the US University, whether it's Karyan, whether it's Mary, whether it's another international admissions rep. As you have seen, international admissions reps are lovely people who are here to support you. We actually had a question um, come in that is... Uh, are you looking out for flaws in our applications or do you focus on the positives? I think it's very clear from what we've spoken about <laughs> today that, you know, international admissions officers are here to support you and to really focus on the positives and, and build a really great class at the universities that they represent. Um, and so don't be put off by, you know, these scary anonymous people who make decisions about your application. It's very much the opposite. They want to get to know you and, and build up a relationship with you. 
Um, so don't be afraid to send an email and I will be sharing um, contact details of Karianne and Mary in our follow-up as well. So you can feel free to reach out if you do have further questions after this. Um, we, I know that we're coming up close on time, so we'll try to fit in a couple more questions if that's okay with you both. Um, and if we don't get to your question just due to timings, do feel free to reach out directly to Mary or Karianne, and I'll also pop in um, our general advising email if you do have questions for Education USA. Um, okay, good question here is, as, as liberal arts institutions, do you expect UK students to have a big range of you know, subjects that they're studying at A-level, or if they don't, do you expect for them to be engaged outside of the classroom in particular areas? Um, are you still going to consider applications from a student who is heavily involved in STEM and that's very much their, their thing, or likewise humanities? What would you both think to that? So yes, yes, and yes, I mean, when, <laughs> when, when you're applying to our schools, now granted, this will be different if you're applying to a, a very big school like the University of Pittsburgh. I, I've been on panels with a representative and I can speak for this. It may be different. Uh, there may be different requirements to applying to the School of Engineering compared to the School of Arts and Sciences where that actually will make a difference. At, at Colgate, we are a liberal arts and sciences school. That actually is the long terminology that at, at most liberal arts schools, it, it technically is. And we have many students who tell us they want to major in economics and then they take their first class at school and then they decide that that's not the career for them. They don't have to declare majors until the end of their sophomore year. So there is quite a bit of support once you get to campus to help you narrow down what you want to do. Um, we, we often find that students will, will stay similarly interested, but it's not a requirement, no expectation, and it's not uncommon for students to switch their academic interests. Yeah, and for us, we understand that um, your GCSE is going to kind of cover a lot of the breadth, and then you get to focus in a bit more. Um, and so as long as you are finding ways to really um, dive in um, to those areas that you are choosing to specialize in, that's what we're going to be looking at, um, especially if you're doing really, really well with the rigor of the A-levels. Um, and just know that um, you could come to campus and still incorporate even more into your educational experiences, Corey and his um, reference. So um, yeah, like whatever path you find yourself on educationally um, within the, the UK system, um, just know that we are, we are keeping all of that in context um, for our own institutions and seeing the bigger picture for you as a potential student. Absolutely. Um, we've had a question here come through, um, which I'm happy to take about when does the process for US university applications begin? Um, we typically recommend students spend sort of 12 to 18 months on the process, a little bit longer than you might on a UK UCAS application, just because as we've seen tonight, there are a few more moving pieces involved and it will require that greater level of reflection. Um, in terms of putting together your essays and things like that. But if you are here tonight with us and you're in year 10 or year 11, there is no time like the present to begin your research process. Um, and, you know, really thinking beyond universities that perhaps you've heard of straight away um, or you've seen mentioned in Legally Blonde. There are so many <laughs> really great universities out there in the US um, that might be a great fit for you um, that perhaps you've not heard of yet. So really take that time to research options that are out there, particularly, you know, if things like funding are an important consideration for you. Um, you know, as we've heard earlier on from Mary and Karianne, they both have really generous financial aid options at their universities for international students. And so that might be another reason to look into them further. Um, so yes, I think 12 to 18 months is a good sort of time frame to actually focus in on putting together those application materials, but no time like the present to get started. And I guess we will um, wrap up on one final question for both of you. What, if, maybe if you could summarize in a couple of sentences, what would you say is the best way to kind of guarantee acceptance at your dream school? <laughs> hmm. 
I would say, you know, there is no way to guarantee just given, you know, all the factors. It's obviously quite a moving process, but I would say, you know, um, make sure every detail of your application strongly and best reflects who you are, what you've achieved, what you have to contribute moving forward. Um, we need to see it right away and we need to, for everyone else that's looking at your application to be able to see it right away. So if there's extra contacts that you know Americans may need um, to understand what it means to have the, the school tie, to be you know an all-rounder, um, please make sure that we have that. Um, it's really important that not only the person that oversees that territory sees it, but that anyone looking at your application can see that. We don't know who we are going to admit until we see who has applied. And so uh, um, be excited about every school that is on your college list, uh, whether it is a school that you, uh, it, it, well, I guess I should say, I work with students often where it's not uncommon that they're applying to three liberal arts schools, they're applying to two big universities, they're applying to schools in different countries. You need to put together a list that you feel confident that you could fit at any one of these schools and you would be excited to go to. Um, they're really, um, the fact of the matter is, is that we are going to admit students who we're think, we think are going to thrive on our campuses and you're likely going to, we're going to think that you're going to thrive on, on a lot of our campuses. So um, you may have one dream school, um, but know that uh, because we can't guarantee, we don't know who we're going to admit until everyone applies put together a, a university list that you are proud of, you're excited about, and uh, don't let your friends and family members impact that. Um, stay, stay, stay true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. I think that is such a lovely note to end on. And I think, yeah, be yourself as much as you can in these applications because it's really gonna shine through. Um, so yeah. Mary and Karianne, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure to have both of you present and give such a wonderful insider's view to um, what can sometimes be a kind of mystifying process <laughs> uh, behind the admissions doors. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to pop into the chat um, our Education USA email if you do want to get in touch with us and I'll give Karianne and Mary a chance to just pop theirs in the chat as well. Um, and as I say, we will be sharing their contact info um, after this when we send out the recording. But I hope this has been helpful and um, thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening slash day, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye.